Hi, it's Nathan and Rachel from INeedIVF.co.uk. Today's video is going to be a fairly long one. It's talking about egg sharing. It's a complete guide to egg sharing, looking at the cost effectiveness of IVF and whether it's the right option for you. So if you go down to the description, you'll see that we've time stamped certain sections. So if there's a bit that you're specifically interested in, go and check out that. But let's get started. Egg sharing is a fairly new option, isn't it? Yeah. And not all clinics are offering it, if I'm honest with you. Very few actually are, but it is becoming more and more popular. Effectively, in a nutshell, it's an IVF treatment where you agree to share your eggs that are collected through your IVF cycle and they're shared with another woman who requires IVF but can't use her own eggs. And for that, you get the benefit of either cheaper or free IVF treatment so it's an interesting one but there are some things that you have to specifically explore understand and think about before you go yep this is right for me first of those is the eligibility criteria so obviously you've got your normal IVF eligibility criteria which you can find on the HEFEA website every area in the UK has a different number of IVF cycles that you're allowed so those normal criteria are there but there are some additional criteria for that First one is age. Overall, generally it's a maximum of 35. However, we did find a couple of clinics that had a maximum age of 32 and, and one or two that relaxed the age and actually went up to 37. Your health and your genetic family history. These are also important. So you as the donor can't have any chronic long-term health conditions. That's one of them. So things like endometriosis and PCOS will actually rule you out of this. But also you can't have any serious inheritable diseases such as Huntingdon's, things like that. Um, your BMI. With any form of IVF, you have a BMI requirement. And with egg sharing, it's sometimes a little bit stricter. Um, you generally have to be between 18 and 30. But there, there were three clinics that we found that were actually under 27, and the lowest we found was actually under 25, believe it or not. So there is slightly more strict around that. Smoking, you as the donor must have been off smoking for a minimum of three months. Your ovarian reserve, about three quarters of those mentioned that you have to have good ovarian reserve, and this is measured at your initial appointment through your blood work. Finally, they actually look at your previous IVF history. Um, just under half of them mention that they don't allow individuals who've had a previous history of low ovarian response. Um, so Rachel and I wouldn't be sure if that would impact us because we got five and seven eggs respectively. But the NHS normally deem a failed cycle as less than three eggs, um, but not all private clinics do uh, deem that as a failed response. So. Rachel's just going to talk to you a little bit about why yeah. egg sharing has become available. So egg sharing, I'd never heard of it until recently, um, but it looks like it's becoming more and more popular for a few reasons. One of the key things is that women going into IVF uh, treatment are getting older because generally our, as a population we're starting our families later in life as age has an impact on your egg quality and your ovarian reserve mm -hmm. a lot of these ladies are now needing to use donor eggs to successfully become pregnant yeah you can see that in this graph yeah. here um where it's sort of the fertility rate uh, per thousand mm -hmm. against maternal age as you can see here it is quite stark when you sort of get sort of 35 to 39 and 40 onwards it's quite a substantial decrease yeah. in, in your fertility rate. Essentially, that means that we're doing more and more cycles of IVF that are with donor eggs. Mm. So you've gone from having 19,000 cycles with donor eggs in 2006 to having 3,924 in a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. That's a huge increase, obviously, in the requirement for donor eggs. This is very much restricted by the fact that uh, we don't have enough people donating their eggs. Yeah. Many reasons for that, obviously, as we all know, going through IVF and, and the egg retrieval process is a pretty big burden on somebody. But also there is a limit to the financial donation that can be given mm. for those. And that's about £750. That's pounds, and that's the maximum. Yeah. And a lot of clinics 
won't give that maximum amount either. Mm -hmm. So um, I think a lot of ladies are choosing not to donate their eggs because they can't get recompense for it. So what you've got is you've got private IVF and NHS IVF clinics needing donor eggs but not having enough and therefore not being able to offer services to ladies who require a donor mm -hmm. egg. By offering kind of an egg sharing situation they are creating a relationship between the three which is beneficial for everybody mm -hmm. so it gives the egg donor a reduced price or free IVF mm -hmm. treatment and the person requiring the eggs gets their eggs for their, their cycle and then the IVF clinic are getting the benefits of both of these people. Mm -hmm. they well they can sell it then can't they? Selling their the treatment. Yeah. So that is where it's all come from. Mm -hmm. So the real big question is would it be the right choice for you? And, and that is a very individual thing and everybody is going to be a little bit different but it's not something to take lightly because you really need to be ha happy that another lady is going to be using your ex mm -hmm. and that there are potentially going to be other children made from those ex. So it's really about getting all the information and evaluating whether it's the right choice for you. So we've got here um, a few questions that we think that you should consider before you embark on egg sharing. Can you afford a regular IVF treatment without going through the egg sharing process and would you be able to afford a couple of cycles that you might need to, to achieve pregnancy. Are you happy to give away half of your eggs um, to a stranger or to someone you don't know? There are sometimes options to give your eggs away to people that you do know if mm -hmm. you know somebody who requires egg donor. That's particularly common in same-sex yes. uh, couples. Are you happy with accepting that because half of your eggs will go to another lady that will reduce your chances of a clinical pregnancy. Now it's important to know that this is purely because you will have less eggs to begin with um, and not because of any other reason but there is that kind of consideration there. Most clinics require counselling um, so are you happy to accept that? If your eggs went to a, a recipient and they became pregnant and you did not, how would you feel about that? I think that's probably one of the toughest questions, you know, to know that maybe somebody else got pregnant and you didn't. How would that make you feel? Because obviously that is a scenario that could come up. And from your own eggs. Yeah, exactly. From your eggs, you know, how would you feel if your eggs have produced a child for somebody else and not for you? So uh, do you have the time to go through IVF? Yes. You know, it takes 8, 12, 16 weeks even to go through a full IVF cycle. Mm -hmm. So do you have the time to do it? Rach skipped one of the questions, which is how would you feel mm. if in 18 years a child created with your egg got in touch with you? Yeah. Important one to consider. It is. Egg sharing is very much a similar setup to adoption, where the once you share your eggs with somebody else, the child that is produced from that that is is theirs. But when they reach 18, they have the child has the right to look up your information mm. and to get in touch with you if they want to. So how would you feel about that? If you changed your mind through your treatment and decided that you weren't in a, a place to share your eggs, would you be able to afford the full treatment costs? Because most clinics will then expect you, obviously, to foot the bill of your treatment. And, and you know, the last one is, do you meet the criteria? Um, like you said, there's a fairly strict criteria that um, needs to be met in a lot of cases. And I think it's really important that you look at these before you actually start the journey because you need to ask these questions before you make that decision and I think you have to do it as a couple if there's two of you involved. So just write down your answers to that and help that form pros and cons around it and whether it's right for you. Yeah. And we'll go into a little bit about the pros and cons now. So we've already touched on a lot of these to be honest. But there are a couple we haven't. Big pro, it gives you discounted or free IVF yeah. treatment. So that's a huge one. I'm going to put a link in the video to a private cost video. And I think the stark figure that came out of that is that if you just need IVF for every cycle, and on average it takes 2.2 cycles of IVF to get pregnant, it will cost you, if you have to have it private, £11,275. On average. On average. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, huge, huge amount of money. So the fact that you can get one, mm -hmm. maybe even more mm -hmm. treatments, for free or heavily reduced is, is a big positive. Yeah. I think another positive is infertility journeys, they're 
very, very personal. However, you build up friendships and communities around it. Rachel and I have met so many people now who have gone through their own infertility journey, of going through IVF, or in many different stages. And actually the thought of being able to help someone else who you have been in a similar situation to them, I think it could feel really, really good. Yeah. And then a final one is the reduction of egg waste. This one's a little bit of a difficult one. Essentially, if, they, if, if a clinic freezes your eggs and you don't get back in touch, you change your address and they can't get in touch, they have no choice but to destroy your eggs. Um, and the same after 10 years, even, even if you don't want them to, they have to destroy your eggs after that. So that reduction in egg waste is something that I think is, is an interesting, interesting one. And for people who are very conscious of that, it, it could be something that pushes it in that direction. Want to take the next one? Yeah, so the other advantage of it really is, other than some of the testing, which we'll go into a little bit later, pre your treatment, it, there's no additional treatment required. Mm-hmm. So it's still going to be the same IVF protocol that you would have gone into anyway. So um, there's no additional steps to it mm-hmm. um, other than um, the testing at the beginning. Yeah, the only caveat that I'll put on what Rachel said there mm-hmm. is that some private clinics will, in fact it comes up in one of the cons here, is that they'll sometimes be a little bit more aggressive in their stimulation of you um, through that protocol. So it does increase your risk of OHSS, so that's one of the cons, but she's quite right that no additional treatment is actually required, it's the same process. Um, And the final one? And the final um, one is if you don't produce enough eggs, then you will likely actually receive them all. So if the clinic isn't happy with the number of eggs produced, then they will usually cancel it as an egg sharing cycle and you can use it as a standard IVF Mm -hmm. cycle. So you will just receive all of those eggs. And this is very clinic specific, but a lot of them, and I think it was about 80% when I was researching this, 80% of them would not charge you um, and they do have this in place. The other 20%, um, some of them would charge you a small portion <laughs> and some of them didn't have this caveat in place. So it's just important to make sure you understand exactly what your clinic um, does. The cons, we already talked about it a little bit. Um, your chance of pregnancy is slightly reduced. That is nothing to do with the treatment. It's all to do with the fact that you have less eggs to potentially fertilise and then you have less eggs that go on that developmental journey. So therefore you have a slightly lower chance of creating a top quality uh, blastocyst. Your recipient could get pregnant and if you don't, this could cause you, you know, quite substantial emotional distress and people have talked about the depression. There was a very big news article about the depression that this exact situation caused one woman. Um, there's actually a risk um, that your recipient could, you know, inadvertently identify you if they were sharing specifics of their story online. Obviously, me and Nathan have been sharing about I- our IVF process and stuff. If uh, a couple was to do similar and they'd received your eggs, there's a possibility they could accidentally kind of identify you, and that's something you might not uh, be comfortable with. Um, and then, like Nathan said uh, a minute ago, there are some clinics who will stimulate you a little bit more enthusiastically in order to get as many eggs as possible, and that obviously increases the risks of OS. OHSS. OHSS. <laughs> and then the final bit is treatments, if you have to have additional treatments like ICSI, mm. um, because your partner suffers with male factor infertility, then they'd still be payable. Although some places do offer a discount, so that could also be sort of a small benefit, benefit. in a way as well. Yeah. So that's a little bit about your pros and cons, and it, it just helps you in making your decision. How does the IVF process actually work for mm. egg sharing, yeah. and how does it differ? So again, I'm going to link um, up in one of the cards just above about the normal IVF process and the video that we have for that, because the actual process itself doesn't differ hugely, and that will give you a really good overview of how the IVF process will work. First difference is more about the discussions that you'll have. The first appointment, you'll go into a lot more detail about the risks associated with egg sharing and how it specifically works in your clinic. Um, So they'll give you exactly what their rules are, for instance, what they'll do if there's an odd number of eggs, i.e. in most you'll get the extra one. What the minimum is, a lot of clinics the minimum was eight, so if you've got less you get to keep them all. Again, each clinic is slightly different. And they will tell you about the 
fact that you could be informed of the recipient's treatment outcome, but it won't have any identifiable information. And I think most of the time that's up to yourself whether you want mm -hmm. to receive that information yeah. or not. And number two? Uh, so number two is the additional testing that you'll go through. So there are obviously some tests that will be the same as you would go through pre any other IVF procedure, um, but there are also some additional ones. And the cost of those tests on average is about £307. Mm -hmm. But you can see a huge list of tests there. The ones, a couple of the ones that are different uh, that you wouldn't usually go through are, for example, a cervical smear test. Wouldn't usually, unless there was some kind of family history, be tested um, as a carrier for cystic fibrosis or chromosomal analysis, sickle cell thalassemia, um, etc. You would usually only be tested for those if there was actually a known risk, um, but you will be tested for all of those because obviously if you're sharing your eggs with somebody else, they don't want to introduce um, you know, any of those conditions into another family. Mm, absolutely. So difference number three is basically it's another appointment. Yeah. So it's your second appointment. You would still have that consent appointment as part of a normal IVF cycle. The difference is that you would normally have to have had a counselling session either before you consent or during that consent um, and it will be held with a specifically trained infertility counsellor. So that won't be a regular nurse but it will be someone who's specifically trained in counselling you to ensure that you understand the consequences of the egg sharing agreement. Difference number four it's about the allocation of eggs. As I said, you will there will be a minimum number of eggs that your clinic specifies. That's normally about eight, and how they'll all be allocated. What's really important to remember is that your eggs will be split before your own fertilization takes place. So it's not like they fertilize one or two, and basically you get the best eggs. It's complete and utter luck. Um, they just divide the eggs evenly. You take your share. The other share goes to the donor. Um, recipient. Pardon? Recipient. recipient. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and also, if you don't produce a, enough eggs, um, sometimes the clinic will actually stop your treatment at that stage. And if you want to progress with your own final bit of IVF, you'll have to pay the remaining fees. So that's important to note. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. As Nathan said before, if you require any additional service, services such as like ICSI, um, then they may be put payable either at full cost or maybe sometimes a reduced cost, um, but that will be as a, an agreement with your clinic. And uh, finally, difference number six is that you will have a follow-up schedule to discuss the outcome of your treatment, uh, but also to discuss the outcome of the recipient's treatment if that's something you have chosen. Mm -hmm. and we'll um, go into more about that in a to, minute. To Okay, so I guess that leads on quite nicely, doesn't it? Uh, what are the rights of the egg sharer and the egg recipient? Yeah. Um, so, um, the first and the most important thing is that you have the right to withdraw your consent at any point up until those eggs are divided mm -hmm. um, between you and the recipient. So you have that right to change your mind at any point up until that stage. If you had gotten to the point where the eggs had already been split and the ones that were going to the egg recipient had already gone, unfortunately, then yeah, that, that is it. And that's already done. So there's a cost to that. Yeah. You'll be liable for those costs if you do withdraw treatment. Yeah. The other one is about your rights when there's an unsuccessful cycle due to a lack of response. And this does vary mm -hmm. among clinics. It's really important that you understand your own liabilities in the case of a reduced response. Mm. So many just stop the cycle completely and you won't pay for anything, but if you wish to proceed, you have to pay for the treatment, as we mentioned earlier. But some do have different legislation and different rules around that, so check yeah. that out. As an egg donor, you will be required to go onto the HEFA donor and recipient register. Mm -hmm. um, this is a legal requirement. Um, and it basically is because any children which result from your eggs have a right to be able to, at the age of 18, um, receive information about yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, that you've got that uh, legal requirement to be on that donor register. Absolutely. And in the UK, 
One of the interesting facts, your eggs can only be used to create up to 10 families, and that's to do with genetic diversity. So we talked briefly about the final appointment and how you might find out about the recipient's success. Um, you can legally ask certain information. So the first one is that you can ask for the number of children that were conceived by your donation. And you can also ask about the sex and the year in which that child was born. Yeah. Then when that child reaches 18, this is why you go onto the register, that child has a legal right to find information about you. So they can go and look up your name and address at the time that you registered as a donor. Mm -hmm. And that's held actually on the HEFEA website. Yeah. However, it is very important to understand this, but the recipient of your egg is the legal parent of the child under UK law. Yeah. So you have no rights to that child, it's just that they can contact you if that child chooses to. Yeah. So what are the financial impacts of egg sharing? As we briefly touched on, um, it costs about, on average, £11,275 per live birth for private IVF. Without any additional exactly. add-ons or... Which comes to about £4,500 per cycle. So every time you go through a egg-sharing IVF treatment, you save yourself up to £4,500. You know, so it's, it's well, well worth thinking about. So it's a way to reduce your financial burden, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there are we, we know a number of individuals who have either had to go abroad or have actually chosen not to have children because they physically can't afford yeah. IVF. It's not a cheap, cheap option. Yeah. There are still some financial obligations. The consultation fees average around £307. Often clinics will take that payment up front and then if you go ahead with the treatment, it's refunded. Drugs, actually, in the majority of these, unlike normal IVF, the majority of clinics actually cover your medication costs as well. But if you don't, um, then you'd be liable for those medications. If you get them from the clinics themselves, they're around £500. But you can get them cheaper online as long as you've got a prescription um, and they can come in at around £200. And then the final thing that most clinics will charge you for is the HEFA, reg HFEA registration fee, which is £75. It's worth considering the financial impacts. Yeah. Um, even if you go through HR and there's still some costs that you'd have to do yeah. up front. Absolutely. For example, if you did need ICSI on top of your normal cycle, then that's an average of about £897. Um, so you would still be liable for that cost. Or you may, may be able to negotiate yeah, some exactly. kind of reduced rate, but you would still have to pay a mm -hmm. um, certain amount. So I, I think I'll get Rachel to talk about this one, but it's the emotional impact of egg sharing. Yeah. So it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster, um, and obviously there's going to be some really strong side effects of the meds you're on during it, and obviously that will then impact on how you're feeling about, you know, being an egg donor and doing egg sharing cycle. Many people need additional emotional and mental health support. Obviously, as we've spoken already, you have to have at least one counselling session. And it may be that you, you want to choose to go back to that counsellor mm. and discuss it further as you go through the process. It's really quite a challenging time mm. and um, couples have to make sure that they're on the same page yeah. because the last thing you want to do is to go into something like this without you both being in agreement on it's the right thing to do. Um, you've got questions like, if you say had a successful cycle, or would I have gotten pregnant if I hadn't shared my eggs? Did I do a good thing by donating them? If they didn't get pregnant, or, um, you know, and you may end up, may, might end up feeling guilty that somebody else hasn't got pregnant um, through your eggs. Mm -hmm. There's loads of different aspects to it. And there are other things, aren't there, you know? Mm -hmm. There's, there's a feeling of lack of fairness. Yeah. People don't think that it's fair that they didn't get pregnant because they did a good thing. These are yeah. these are all things people think, you yeah. know. And you put even more pressure on yourself yeah. sometimes because I know some people this is like their last option because they can't afford any more regular IVF treatments. Yeah. So there's all that additional pressure sure. as well, isn't yeah. there? So what I'd say is if you do need to get additional emotional support outside of the what the clinic offers is the British Infertility Counselling Association have some really, really great counsellors there. They're all obviously registered and all have specialist knowledge in infertility counselling. So if you do need some support, that's a really good point of, point of, point of call. Yeah. So finally, um, 
some questions that you might want to ask your clinic if you do decide that you want to go ahead with egg sharing. These ones are just to help make sure you understand exactly what's expected of you and what the clinic specific Protocol. protocols are. Yeah. Exactly. So, list of questions. How many eggs do you use to determine a successful cycle? Yeah. If I don't produce enough eggs, what's the process and what are the costs? What are the additional costs that I will have to pay for? How are the eggs divided? What are your success rates per embryo transferred? What are the joint success rates for my IVF and the recipients? How long will it take to find an appropriate recipient? Because there can sometimes be a longer time delay between you making the decision to go ahead and finding an appropriate recipient. And do you, as a clinic, have any specific eligibility criteria? Just helps you know what you're signing up to. Yeah, no, definitely. Especially that thing about the appropriate recipient, because we don't always, uh, if you're an egg donor, you might not think about it, but, you know, your recipient is probably going to want to have somebody who's got similar traits to themselves. Absolutely. In terms exactly. of, uh, you know, height, ethnicity, height. Eye colour, hair colour. Exactly. Same as, same as you would look at if you needed to use a sperm donor. Mm -hmm. You thing. would want similar traits so that, the um, you know resulting child hopefully was a similar to yourself. Some Had yeah. some resemblance to yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know some people aren't bothered by that, but no, there, are, there will be people who obviously want to find that similarity. Mm. And I'd say just for my final thoughts, really, we didn't really know a lot about egg sharing. I'd say until about three months ago, did we? We've done a lot of research into it now, and I think. Rachel and I are a, a little bit more advanced in our age, um, and obviously we've had our successful cycle, but both of us would like another child, I think, mm. and our issue is obviously we may be 35 before we go ahead, but I think... Almost at the point I will You be. will be, yeah. I, I, I You're already 35. Yeah, exactly. But that means that we are unlikely to be able to use it, yeah. but I think if we were a little bit younger, it's mm -hmm. something we would very seriously consider. Yeah. I think for me, it's the... I mean, obviously, it's more about it's your eggs at the end of the day, so it's your decision. But I think the altruistic part of actually helping other people while at the same time yeah. still potentially having yeah. your own child. Yeah. I How think you? definitely, like, I think for me, during the whole infertility process and the number of people that I have met or made friends with or seen online who struggle, who need donor eggs. And I feel like if I could provide that for them, mm. that would give me a really good feeling. Okay. And, you know, I don't want to get into masses of debt going through IVF, you know, more, potentially multiple times in order to, you know, get that the child that um, we really want. So I think for me, it would be a really good compromise. Obviously, I'd need to do a lot more thinking about it and like Nathan said, it, unfortunately, it's unlikely that I'll be of the correct age mm. by the time we're ready to, to have that second child. Mm. But if we were a bit younger, it's definitely something I would have considered because I think to hopefully bring both happiness to yourself and to somebody else who's going through that is such a valuable thing. It's powerful. It is. Mm. But also... I can understand why people find it so incredibly Absolutely. difficult. Absolutely, it's an individual decision. You know, to make that decision, and, and it's not right for everybody. And that's mm -hmm. you know, totally, you know, IVF is such a stressful thing, and to add that additional kind of emotion into it can be so difficult. Okay. Hugely challenging. So, thank you for watching. Um, smash that like button for us. Um, <laughs> and hit that subscribe if you want to see more from us. And just a final point, I think I'd like some comments. If you've been through egg sharing, or even if you're considering it, I'd absolutely love you to comment on the video because it's it's actually an area we haven't actually met anybody going through egg sharing yeah. yet. So it'd be really, really interesting to get your thoughts on it. So thanks ever so much. Subscribe and see you later.